some individuals who asked about that and were hoping, um, you know, who couldn't make it tonight and were hoping um, that we'd be recording it. But welcome everyone. Thank you um, for joining us for this evening's author series program with Carrie Arsenal and her book, Milltown. Um, before I hand things over to Carrie, just a few housekeeping pieces. Um, first, I would like to thank our Nature Program Series sponsors, Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment for their continued support of our programming. I would also like to thank the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation for their sponsorship of our author series. Um, and just want to mention a few upcoming programs that we have. Um, as many of you know, we have, you know, we tend to be very avian heavy on our programming, especially in spring, and it is May, so it's all about the birds. Um, and every Thursday morning in Jackson um, and Saturday morning at the Brownfield Bog, we have birding trips going on in May. Um, because of the current state of things, they are registration, advanced registration required. Um, and you can do that online right on our website, tinmountain.org. Um, but you know, we had a group going out that went out this morning. Um, we'll be birding in the bog this Saturday. Um, and also looking ahead, um, May 15th, Saturday, May 15th, um, is our annual field day. It would normally be our annual meeting and field day, um, but we are opting only to have um, the field programs in person. Um, so we have a number of field trips scheduled at our various campuses. Um, so lots of options to fit everyone. Again, those are on our website as well. And then we'll be hosting our annual meeting virtually on the evening of Wednesday, May 19th. Um, and that is a registration required event unlike most of our um, evening Zoom events. There's no fee with that, but we do, um, we are asking for advanced registration and there is a link to sign up for that on our website as well. Um, just a reminder to those of you who have not joined us for a Zoom program before um, and because, you know, um, you know, dialogues are not the norm for our evening programs. Um, you know, just in terms of protocol, we ask that um, that you mute yourself while the program is going on so that we don't pick up any background noise. Um, we do have a handful of questions that we've prepared in advance for Carrie that we'll be asking um, as well as uh, several questions um, that our, that the environmental book group discussion raised yesterday um, that we'll be asking. Um, and after that, we will invite um, the audience to, um, to ask questions of Carrie. And at that point, um, you can do so by unmuting yourself and asking the question directly, or at any point during the program, you can type your questions into the chat feature at the bottom. Um, and Katie will be monitoring that um, and we'll be, if there are similar questions, we might be lumping those together, but just in terms of how we'll be um, proceeding with this. Whew. All right, and with that, <laughs> and with that said, um, we are very excited. I think a number of you um, heard, you know, the, the exchange between uh, Carrie and Nelson, our facilities manager, um, but that that's how you know, we were connected with Carrie in the first place, um, because they are childhood friends. Um, but we are very excited to have Carrie here with us. She is um, a book critic and book editor at Orion Magazine, um, as well as a contributing editor to the Literary Hub. Um, this is Carrie's first book published last year um, to much acclaim, including uh, being named a National Book Critics Circle finalist for the Leonard Prize, um, a New York Times editor's choice, um, as well as a top book of 2020, um, who, in, in the Chicago Tribune, Publishers Weekly, Literary Hub, as well as others. So I am very excited um, to welcome Carrie Arsenal. Ooh, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Nora and Nelson for bringing me here. I'm really happy to be here. And, um, 
and and white birch books in north conway where if anybody so desires to buy a book i would recommend your local bookstore um i'm just gonna i'm gonna start with a instead of reading i'm gonna start by playing a, a reading that i has already recorded that i did and it goes along with the slideshow so um it's the preamble of my book which is just the right before chapter one um what else yeah that's it let me just uh, get that screen up. Hold on one second. Share. Okay. All right. Um, Nora, speak up if you can't hear it for some reason. I'm going to play it right now. Okay. okay. Preamble. That's good. Mexico Maine is a small paper mill town that lies in a valley or river valley, as we now call the area because I suppose you can't have one without the other. The hills are low and worn and carved by the waters surrounding them and trees line the rivers, which confine the town. Coursing through the valley's midsection, the Anderskagen River. Just across the S hook in the river in the neighboring town of Rumford, the mill's smokestacks poke holes in the white plumes they create. That's money coming out of those smokestacks, our fathers used to say about the rotten smelling upriver drafts that surfaced when the weather shifted. That smell loitered amid the softball games we played beneath those stacks and lingered on our father's shirt sleeves when they came home from work, allowing us to forgive the rank odor for what it provided. Our stack meets sky, the wide, slow moving Andeskagen pivots and bleeds south and east under bridges and over rapids pushing through dams, slinking around islands and along inlets, skidding through other mill towns of Jay, Lewiston, Topsom, Brunswick, and picking up flotsam and jetsam for passengers and canoes. In the calmer sections, its velvety waters press on with the slow caress of lava and despair. Vapid pools form when the water has nowhere else to go, sheltering the river's secrets and dark lagoons where they congregate in the muck and fester like complicity. Sometimes the river pauses or eddies when it meets an obstacle and diverts into other routes, into unpredictable detours, following the edges of its design, yet it proceeds nonetheless. Rivers are living bodies that need oxygen, breathe life, turn sick, can be wrecked by neglect like human bodies which we often think of as separate, not belonging to the landscape that bore them out. They tell a story, these bodies. They are the story. The deep grottos of the past, the great polar ice cap melted into glaciers, and its calving mass crawled north, carving long, deep ruts that became the lakes and rivers of Maine. Our geologic past foretold everything about our future. But in this future, Lives are unlived, secrets never revealed, and stories remain unwritten about how much we all lose. In this future, I learn of asphalt lakes, people bulleted with disease, burning tires scarring the sky, the first stake and buried in unmarked graves, the evisceration and erasure of home. In this future, we pardon legislators who convince us nature will sort itself out. In this future, we will have forgotten everything that came before, and our only legacy for those who will supersede us is the promise of ruin. It started early, this ruining of bodies and the yawning of leaders who didn't care about a landscape so altered by us, it's reciprocating the abuse. When I walk along the Anderskagen and over its bridges, I try to see the river as it was or could have been. Even in its current spoiled state, it's still a thing of great agency. The transactions of its waters an awesome sight, wearing down granite and earth with the repeated force of its movement. Down at the rocky outcrops when my father was a boy, a park with a bandstand and grassy plateaus wrapped the town with music and tranquility. There you can imagine the thunderous negotiation of the river's turbulent waters as they passed, defeating the submissive notes of flutes and clarinets. Before my father, my grandfather walked in the same park, 
where shrubs and flowers and little stones drew a path amid the shade of chestnuts that were about to die. Before him, Abenaki crouched along the Androscoggin's edge to catch salmon wafting on its tide. Salmon had long flung their way upstream from the Atlantic to spawn, swimming past floodplains and alewives that gathered in the river's current. Grismills and pollution and dams and the lawmakers discouraged their run-ups, but the hopeful salmon pressed on until they disappeared, except for the few each year who still hurl themselves up and over that first dam, wondering if by tenacity they will prevail. Their fate remains unknown. Phew, you know, it's funny, it doesn't get easier to hear that. Not, not because it's my voice, but um, some of the ideas in it. Um, I, I guess I'd like to start there as sort of introduce you to the introduction a little bit. Um, I think I think you could tell that listening to the preamble or reading it, if you've read the book, that um, this is, um, it's kind of setting you up for the experience of the book. It's saying that in language and tenor and tone that this is not going to be your tip typical environmental book um, or even a typical book. Um, and I just, I did it this way. I really wanted to sort of take you by the hand and show you the river, like, here's my town. I wanna to show this to you, just follow me, you know, first person point of view. Um, and I think that that intro or that preamble also says, you know, it says the built in natural environments are at odds. It says that it's about legacies, about family legacies, environmental legacies. It says we're gonna face the constant pressure of swimming upstream, kind of like the salmon, I think. You know, um, that it's gonna follow, it also tells you this book is going to follow the arc of a river. Um, it's gonna be unpredictable and filled with flotsam and jetsam, um, but moving forward always nonetheless, like a river does. And I guess, it's also saying it's not a legal thriller. I don't think legal thrillers start like this. Um, or it's not an investigative journalism because I'm from this place. It's hard to be objective if you, if your family still lives there. It's not just cultural criticism and it's not just a memoir. I think it's, I think it's all of the above to the consternation of my publisher. <laughs> they were having a hard time trying to figure out where to put it, right? Um, but I didn't write it that way or do any of this to be confusing, but to contain the complexities of the story that it tells. Um, I mean, the story is, is complex, right? It, it, I guess for those of you who haven't read it, one of the larger things is that this book is says there's a cost to everything that we use or that we make. And that I think that aligns with what your organization looks at a little bit, or at least in part, I'm sure. Um, and it asks the larger question of like, what kind of life have we made for ourselves when we are poisoned by the very things that sustain us? And in this case, the paper mill. And what are we willing to sacrifice for our own lives? Um, and just to give you a quick introduction and then we can get in. I don't want to talk too long. Um, but the, there's two really two main threads going on here in the book is identity and environment. And what happened was in the middle of writing the book, I found out those two things intersected and crossed. It's also about storytelling itself and we can get to that if we have time. Um, but people always ask the first question, what made me write this book? And so you don't have to ask that because I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> um, I would say there was, first of all, I'd say there's no moment um, because that's the thing about toxic disasters, which this is about in part, about um, trying to connect the mills pollution with disease. That's sort of the investigation part, but there's the thing about toxic disasters like this, they're very decentralized and hard to pin down where they begin and where they end. So my book is also in that way, reflects that same, it's hard to pin down. Um, and these kind of toxic disasters are slow and ambiguous in nature and reach, and they're largely out of sight, just like this town itself and the people that live there. Um, and there's a, instead of a, 
a sort of a violence like Chernobyl or a tornado or people getting mowed down with guns. This is more of an attritional violence, a very slow attritional violence that happens to a town and people. So it's not really what we think of a disaster at all. It's not even in the news. Um, so I was thinking a lot about how to write that when, you know, how do you get, how do you get somebody's attention about a slow, silent disaster, right? Um, we can talk about that later too. Um, but technically what got me going was probably in 2001, I was looking at my grandfather's obituary and his, um, his death certificate in Rumford Town Hall. And it had contained information that I didn't know about him, like where he was born and who his mother was. This is my father's father. And, and so I was really curious about that. I had been doing a lot of genealogy, trying to find my family tree. Um, also about Acadians, because weirdly, even though practically all of us that lived in Mexico were of Acadian or French Canadian heritage, we didn't really get taught about that. I'm sure Nelson can verify that. We didn't learn anything in school about it. So I thought at age, I don't know, 40 something, I would try to do that. Um, anyway, so I followed this information about my grandfather and come to find out all of it was wrong on the obituary and the death certificate. Mm -hmm. So I thought if, if that's wrong, what else could be wrong in like the archives of our lives or in the archives of our town or, or in just the historical archives of anything? Um, and as I found out, much was or is wrong. Um, so I started following this sort of absent or ambiguous information. Um, and it laid the groundwork for the structure of the book, which is to say, again, there's many tributaries of inquiry um, that follow unexpected paths and unknown paths, because for me, that's the more interesting story anyway. Um, you know, so if you start with a false document, where do you go with, from there? <laughs> so that was one thing about identity. So really starting with my grandfather. And the second part of the book is about the environment, of course. Um, and like I said, there's a cost to everything we produce. Like if you just look around the room you're sitting in right now, make a list if you have a pen handy, and maybe we can talk about it after. But think of all the things that are made of white paper. Um, you know, there's, there's tissue, there's paper, there's notebooks, there's labels, there's um, things, packaging. There's tons of, I'm looking around my office, just millions of things made of white paper specifically. And I want to tell you, if you haven't read the book or if you don't know that um, most mills use chlorine bleaching, most paper mills use chlorine bleaching agents to make paper white. And the resulting byproducts is one of the most dangerous um, toxics known to humankind, dioxins. It makes a, 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 like a really big list of other noxious things, but I focused on, on dioxin. It's really a metaphor for a lot of things, which I'll talk about later too. But the people, expo people exposed to dioxins, I found out are more at risk for cancer and heart disease, which includes my father, whose death was caused by both of those things and caused in the middle of writing this book. Um, so his death didn't was not the impetus for the book. It just happened while I was writing it. Um, you know, government, industry, lobbyists, the EPA, they won't admit this. They won't say because they'll say it's hard to prove the link. How do you prove that dioxin is connected to these things? It is nearly impossible if you think about it, unless you're born with like some kind of like robot chip in your, your body that says everything that you're exposed to, you know, um, it, it's really hard to prove. And I understand that. Um, they'll say more studies need to be done. There's, or, or they even in, in my book, there's a part where they even say they blame a lack of education, lifestyle choices, even your IQ. That's why you got cancer, they'll say. Um, but of course, I see the evidence in all of my family's graves and, and, and many in our town that have written me, especially since um, the book came out. So dioxins, just to give you a little scare fest, um, <laughs> dioxins can impair. Um, these are just some of the things they do. And they, they operate a little bit they're different, but they operate similarly like PFAS chemicals, which you probably read a lot more about in the news today. Um, dioxins can also impair, I'm going to look at a list because I can't remember them all, um, impair fertility, sperm count, childhood development. They can damage or suppress immune systems, interfere with hormones, cause liver damage, infant cardiac malformations, neurodevelopment issues, accelerate female development, and harm unborn fetuses. 
and why I no longer live in Maine, um, and Nelson doesn't either, but we still carry the <laughs> legacy of that paper in our DNA. And here's why, because more than 90% of human exposure to dioxins comes through our food supply and the fatty part of living things like pork, lobster, cows, Parmesan cheese, um, milk, butter, eggs, things that they're byproducts. And because dioxins like PFAS, they bioaccumulate the further up the food chain they go, the, the stronger they become. That's what bioaccumulate means. And um, um, at the top of the food chain are humans and even further up the food chain are human babies who, whose breastfeeding mothers can expose nursing infants to dioxin levels 77 times higher than the EPA recommends. Um, dioxin is also persistent and will linger in the environment and in our bodies forever. Um, it does have a half-life of like, I want to say 13 years, but you keep accumulating it, even though it's going out your body. So you never get rid of it. Um, which kind of, again, is the structure of my book <laughs> a little bit. Um, as Rachel Carson made clear, I think in Silent Spring, she said, it's the little things that, that count because dioxin in the most smallest amounts imaginable or even unimaginable are harmful. Um, Let's see, there's been recent news too. I just wanna to connect this to recent news if you've seen it. There's been um, uh, some discovery about sludge in these farms in Maine and the milk from the cows being uh, contaminated with PFAS. They're probably not te um, testing for dioxins, but I'm sure that's in there because all the documents I found at the Maine DEP, I have documents of those farms where they dump the sludge, the paper mill sludge that had dioxins in it. Um, so that's still happening. That's another thing. I don't I want to say this is not a book that's in the past. It's currently happening in all our bodies, everybody on this phone call. Um, the other thing our mill produced, um, speaking of toxics, um, they produced ambiguity. Now, it's not, it, it's probably just as toxic um, as we all know from the COVID pandemic. Ambiguity can be pretty toxic itself. Um, but what that means. And I think everybody can relate now after this past year is, or relate to a degree is that we are kept in a state of gradual and perpetual injury because, it, because of the non-deliberate exposure to the possibility of death. It's like death hovering over us or the possibility of injury. And that can be just as traumatic as an injury itself. Um, we also, our mill produced an economic dependency on the forest. Um, and uh, outside leadership, um, I don't think, I mean, we do have town leaders there, but the outside leadership, meaning they're always been looking to the mill and those people have never, the, the, the owners of the mill have never actually lived in the town. Also our mill produced, helped produce the demise of, I think the American dream and the, um, the working class of America um, and destroyed the natural environment, the very thing people come to Maine to see. Um, so another conundrum. So that's, uh, let's see, that's some um, environment and identity. And do you want me to stop there? I can, yeah, what time is it? Yeah, 7.30. I, I have, I have, we can talk about storytelling. We can talk about anything you want. I've, I can talk forever. I don't know why. I never used to talk this much. <laughs> yes, I think, yes. Well, we all are stuck. <laughs> sitting in our homes, yes, needing someone um, to talk to. No, but we, um, and thank you for, for that introduction. And I'm not sure how many folks here, I know a, a number of them have read your book. I don't know how many folks um, have not or who are unfamiliar with it, but I think that that was, I mean, a wonderful overview um, and, and introduction. Um, why don't we, you know, I was thinking about doing a reverse, but I think um, you know, to switch gears, maybe we'll we'll start where um, where we had um, talked about, and and you mentioned this a little bit, you know, when you re you know reference that it's not necessarily investigative journalism, and that is, um, you know, you are you're writing, you know, there there is a you know. A plethora of research that went into this, um, you know, into this book, years and years of researching um, on a number of topics. And, you know, it's 
you know, I think you've written it, you know, as objectively, you know, as one can given your, <laughs> given your ties to it. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, how you can remain or, you know, strive for objectivity, um, you know, in presenting sort of this environmental disaster um, and, and shedding light onto it, um, you know, when you do have these, you know, emotional and familial ties to, ties to the community? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and no, none that nobody's asked me that really. Um, so in the book, I am objective and I embraced it. What I did was say, I'm not going to be objective completely, but I'm also not going to be subjective. I mean, I put on my sort of cultural critic, which I'm a book critic. And I put on that hat and said, I'm going to like examine it from this distance, but then I'm going to go in and examine it from a close proximity. So it was like, distance and proximity. And then I also became actually involved with the situation in town with Nestle. So I was, I was a witness to it, but then I became a participant. So again, inside outsider. And then I'm an insider because I grew up there, but I live in Connecticut. So there was that. So I, I just like embraced it. I was a critic. I mean, and an advocate for this town at the same time, because I think these kind of things, you can hold both in your hands. And I, I think it's impossible to say that journalism is objective. I actually disagree with it in a way because just the stories that we choose to pursue are, are subjective in a way. So I think taking those things like witness participant, critic advocate, um, proximity and distance, it sort of enunciated that tension between me being this outsider and insider. And it was, and I embraced it to say, okay, this is not just a story about environment. It's a story about home and identity and what it means to sort of go back to a place um, that maybe doesn't love you back or, or go back to a place that caused as much harm as it did good. And so like to hold all of those things in my hand was what made me write the book in this way. I think, does that make sense? I mean, I, it was, if you take, if you strip away everything from the book and try to find the plot, which somebody did for me, thank God, the, the literal plot is me going home and leaving, going home and leaving. So it's this departure and return again, same kind of tension, right? So every time I would go home, I was like constantly interrogating and building what it means to be from that place. You know, it was like, it was like being in a long, complicated relationship, <laughs> which I think for a lot of people, home is like that, whether you love or hate it or somewhere in between, because when you leave a place, you're never the same person that you return, you know, does that make sense? So I think, I think doing it that way opened up bigger conversations about identity, home, family, legacy, that are all connected to the environment because three generations of my family worked in this mill. Um, yeah, and I really, I also one last thing too, I think, I think I feel strongly that our landscapes define us and you know, we define them, but as the landscapes were shifted under my feet, so did my concepts and feelings about it. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm kind of babbling now. No, that's, I think that is a, a fair representation, um, you know, of tackling it. And I, and I think that ties into another one of the questions that actually um, we had written out before, but just came through in the questioning. And that is, you know, in, in talking about, you know, returning, you know, home and going and leaving. Um, you know, I think one of the questions that that's come up is how, you know, how this book was received, you know, in, you know, both the, the Rumford, Mexico um, community, as well as, you know, you, you write pretty openly about, you know, what is, you know, sort of an intimate family loss when you're talking about um, your father and, you know, with, you know, in, in writing about, the mill and and putting it all on the table, you know, 
I am, you know, you describe sort of, and and I'm, you know, sort of well aware of the defensiveness that that people get over, you know, over things that that they have ownership over. That it's okay for, you know, us to talk about it, you know, to talk about how, you know, what something is. But when it's criticized um, on the outside, that you know that they become defensive. So can you talk a little bit about how, you know, what the response from the community has been from your book? Yeah, um, I would say first that I don't think the book is critical of the town. I think that some people that haven't read it think that, like Janet Mills, who's the governor, um, has said that literally. So she I don't know if she's since read it, but I know that she thinks it's a critical book, but I think the book, I feel like the book was written with a lot of love because I think to get to the heart of environmental storytelling, you have to get to the heart of people. And besides just balancing, I should say, besides balancing those lines that I also, that I said, I also, um, I tried to, during my it was 10 years I was writing this and talking to people. And instead of going to like interrogate or criticize or judge, I really just went there and listened to people. I think that's a big difference than, um, you know, a lot of journalists say they do, but I went, you know, we didn't talk politics. This was all through, you know, all the elections, all the turmoil with the politics. It went, you know, our town went from the biggest Obama supporters in the state to the biggest Trump supporters in the state. That's one thing that happened while I was working this book. But we didn't sit down and talk about politics. We sit down and talk about like skiing or beer. And I think, so, so my approach to it was, you know, people knew, everybody knew I was writing a book, but my approach was not to like, you know, drop a dime on anybody. So, so for that reason, I, I, I in this book am and am not perfect, and there's nobody in this book that's perfect. Everybody is sort of human, you know. Even Doc Martin, who at first tries to sort of help the town, you know, he he tries to bring attention to the, all the health issues, but he's a bit of a dick. Excuse my language. So you know, he he ends up emotionally abusing his wife had for years that I found out, and and not everybody in town loves him. So he's a flawed hero, and I think everybody in this book is like kind of like that because that's what humans are. Everybody is just doing their best. You know, we're all just getting by. So I tried to present people just in their humanness. And because of that, like literally maybe everybody, but two people support the book in the town. I haven't had anything. um, I haven't had any criticism lodged at me. Um, directly or even really indirectly but like somebody told somebody that somebody you know kind of like that but people have been so supportive that like even even people are in the book like Dean Gilbert who Nelson knows he's like signs books for me (laughs) like people want him to sign the book which is like so wonderful and I've had so many people from the town come to a lot of my events especially like repeatedly come to events and have discussions with me. I haven't been able to go back because of the pandemic, which has really been disappointing. There's probably be some like rotten tomatoes thrown at me maybe by some people. So that's one thing that's happened. And then separately that just came to my attention. I don't even know if we talked about this, but um, I was contacted by somebody who said (laughs) secondhand. So somebody told somebody, tell somebody that um, the mill uh, the, the new owners of the mill, and this is all rumor. So I'm saying this out loud. This is rumor. So I don't know. Nobody's come forward. No whistleblower has come forward, but that um, the mill has been destroying some evidence um, based on things that I wrote about in my book so much so that somebody quit one um, and not a, not a local person, somebody quit because of what they were asked to do. And that person won't contact me. Um, I don't know if I really have the time to follow that. So I forwarded it to Erin Brockovich because she's in Maine actually right now dealing with all that PFAS stuff um, on the farms. So that's, I was like, oh, so that's why the mill hasn't contacted me about the book. (laughs) So I haven't had Nestle contact me, like nobody. It's just been eerily silent from the things that are sort of critical. Um, And I think they're critical in a way that is like, it's not necessarily critical at those organizations. It's critical about 
the laws themselves and what we allow, um, like what, in, in Europe, they have this thing called the precautionary principle, right? For toxic chemicals, it says, you have to prove these chemicals are safe before you can put them in the environment. In America, we do it the opposite. The burden falls on us to prove that we got sick. You see how that's bizarre? Um, so I don't even know where I was going with that. But um, you know, our body burden, uh, and, and it is a burden because it's a body burden and that body burden means it's the amount of toxic chemicals um, present in our body is exactly that because we have to bear it um, because our laws, industries, regulatories, agencies, they won't or they can't or something. Um, so back to your question. Um, and in Maine, it's been uh, well received. In fact, just this morning, I woke up to an email and it's a finalist for the Maine Literary Award. So yay. Congratulations. <laughs> yay get to celebrate on Zoom again. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I, the legislators haven't touched it. Um, you know, there's a book group in Maine that I'm working with on Peaks Island. They're gonna try to help me get it into legislators' hands. I don't know, we're, we're sort of trying to still get it. It's been a long, slow crawl, but it's, it's also being taught in like universities and colleges already across the nation at, you know, um, Har you know Terry Tempest Williams and I are gonna do an event at Harvard together. And it's at Princeton, it's at UMO, it's at Stanford, it's at, um, I don't know, Beloit, where I went to school. I just did an event with them. He taught it in two classes. And it's been interesting too, because it's going, and because of all the things that I said the book is trying to do, it's being taught like environmental classes or it's being taught in creative writing classes or um, urban engagement courses or all kinds of different ways. Um, theological, like it was at Wheaton, the theological school. I did a big event there. So anyway, so well received. Um, but suspiciously quiet from some ends of things. <laughs> All right. And do you mind talking about, you know, was, did you talk to your family and ask oh, oh, right. beforehand about, um, you know, about writing about a family loss? Um, no, I didn't really. I just wrote it and I don't even, I mean, I don't think it's, I mean, I don't think our family's that private. Like we don't have anything to hide. There's nothing really to hide. Um, certainly my mother has nothing to hide. If anybody that knows her, um, she's been really happy about it. And like, in fact, goes to all the bookstores in Maine is like, do you have my daughter's book? <laughs> but um, I, I just, I, I think again, just writing, writing the truth, but in a very gentle and human way, you know, I'm not trying to like get anybody not trying to even get the mill really, because it's really what provided me with being able to write a book, you know? Um, so I think just, you know, that's one thing I really tried hard to do is to not judge and to just give you the information and let you be the judge of what you want to judge, you know, what you think is wrong in this picture sort of thing. Um, and my family was pretty, really has been enormously supportive. And I don't even know if they've read the book. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> but they support it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, it was, I should say too, it was, I'm, you asked me this before we talked about it. Um, you know, my father did die in the middle of it, but I was also in the middle of grad school. Um, I was really busy. My husband was working he he was gone. I was in another place. We were driving all around. I really didn't have time to be like suffering through anything. So it was just busy. Um, and you know, also grow. You, you're you're all from New Hampshire and New England. You know, you just get stuff done. You just do it. You just got to do what you got to do. I, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't stop doing what I had to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned when you were talking about the community response that it was, um, you know, overwhelmingly positive, especially, you know, about the individuals that you wrote about and you did share, you know, a number of stories, unfortunately, many of which, you know, ended, you know. Yeah. Um, 
so many people died in the book as I wrote it. It was like, it was crazy. Yeah. So, and, and you, you mentioned that, um, you know, that since writing the book, more individuals have come forward and I'm not sure how many people, um, you know, listening tonight have explored your website, but additionally, on on your website, you have um, the cancer yearbook, um, you know, sort of bearing witness to to and and sharing these stories of individuals who you know have gotten <laughs> ill um, a, as a result of you know living in this community and exposure. Um, can you? I imagine, or, or as I was reading that and looking through, I mean, one of my thoughts was that there that there you know potentially could be sort of a, an emotional burden of carrying all these individual stories um and that there may be sort of an you know whether it's realistic or not this expectation you know in in giving you this story and having you share it publicly um an expectation of a resolution or some sort of vindication, um, you know, in airing it publicly. And can you, um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what it's like to have people share these stories with you? Yeah, I feel pretty, not to overuse that word, but I feel pretty privileged that people will just email me as I always supply my email and it's on my website. If anybody wants to email me, I'm always surprised how private they they're sharing, but I feel like that's kind of part of what I wanted the book to do. I mean, I don't like to say what I want the book to do because I want you to do whatever you want with it. But what I kind of wanted to do is just get conversation going about this, you know, in the first part of any sort of resolution to any kind of toxic disaster is really to reveal first. And this is what this book does because it really hasn't been anything that's been talked about so that when people just started emailing me very private details and photos of themselves and their parents. And it was kind of like, wow, this, I feel really privileged that they trust me. And I feel like that trust was built from the way I wrote the book again, to go back to say that like not judging people and just saying, here's a problem, you know? Um, and I don't know, I don't feel as much as an emotional burden as I feel like it's just like a responsibility that I don't know the the cancer yearbook is still um, in flux. I still need to work on it, but it seems like I've just been so busy since the book came out, um, and I'm thinking to expanding it to everybody in the state um, because I think it presents a different. I mean, I feel a responsibility, just like I was taught to be and how to work and growing up working class, you know. And if you want to read more about that, I published an essay. <laughs> I published an essay in the New York Review of Books called My 86 Jobs, because I've had 86 jobs since I was 15. And so I have, I feel responsible for these stories and doing something with them. So that's what partly too why I started the Cancer Yearbook to sort of pay witness and say, here's a different kind of evidence. You say you can't prove the link. How about these, you know, hundreds of people who have cancer? What about their stories? And um, you know, it's, and that's not to say that your feeling um, is evidence, but it is to say, let's just step back for a second and look at the situation and just like, let's have a, gut, a kind of a gut check, you know, I mean, sure, they're not going to prove that this connects to this. But if you look back and you say, wow, Mexico, Maine is what, I don't know, 3000 people, if that, and like, I don't know how many kids, I can't remember what in the book, but how many kids were at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center from Rumford? It was like 90% of the kids there were from Rumford, Mexico. It's a small town. Like just step back for a second and say, there's a problem. So that's kind of what that is too. It's a different kind of evidence and a different kind of memorial too, um, which is another whole complicated thing. Um, yeah. All right. Um... Thank you um, for that thinking. I'm trying to decide which one of our, <laughs> the next lines um, to go with. And, and maybe we um, double back. So, um, you know, we talked about sort of writing objectively and, and the, you know, from a outside, inside, step up, you know, 
up close and big picture. Um, can you talk about sort of as you are writing and researching this, um, dealing with, uh, you know, and, and sort of cracking into dealing with the industry and bureaucracy. So both, um, you know, both with the mill, um, with some of the, you know, the state agencies, um, and even and even with Nestle, because you know, I know in in one of some of the conversations that we yeah. have about the book ahead of time, there's, you know, and and sort of what you were talking about, really, you know, a lot of it comes down to sort of that precautionary principle versus, you know, the burden of proof, and there's this almost sort of tongue in cheek, like we can see. Yeah. Yeah. The, why, you know, this open just, secret. Yeah. This tiny town in Maine has all these cancer cases, but there's no report that is going to, you know, tie point A to point B. So, you know, we're in this weird nebulous, um, you know, area. And I am, you know, how it was, you know, both just not infiltrating, but, but, you know, speaking with you know these individuals and i imagine at, at times it was incredibly frustrating sort of having yeah. this sort of open secret and, and trying to move past that yeah it's it's actually kind of connected to what somebody said in the chat too uh, somebody said i think the book was good at showing the social environment which is also damaged by the mill and i'm going to respond to your question with an answer to that too is that um I studied a lot about what happened at Love Canal, New York, and that toxic disaster. And it, there's a whole, it was the first time they hired sociologists to look at a disaster because they wanted to see what the human um, disaster was or the human cost. Again, there's a cost to everything, right? And, and the most fascinating part of that report was there was one of the residents said, and this about sums it up, to what you're saying, Nora, uh, one of the residents said, everybody knew it was going on and nobody knew it was going on <laughs> um, because it would be, you know, it, it's so complex. Like I, you know, dealing with the first layer of complexity is the language itself. Now I'm, I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm a reader. I was a paralegal. I know how to le read legalese. I know, you know, I'm a pretty smart reader. I, I read books for a living. And the language itself was a barrier to information for me to get. So um, I can't even, and I, I write about that directly, like when they're burning tires for fuel, I can't even begin to understand what they're talking about and the regulations, I mean, at all. So the language itself, and that's why I say it's a little bit about storytelling, but like looking at the language and how to even just kind of get through that to even get at some kind of other truth. And sometimes I think it's purposeful. Sometimes sometimes I think it's just bureaucracy moving at the slow pace bureaucracy moves. It's like people don't, just in my town meeting uh, that's coming up here, we were reading some land use regulations. And I was like, what? I don't even understand what this means. You know, I mean, who has time to figure all this stuff out? So me working on this for 10 years, you'd think I could but I barely could, you know, just kind of really take down words to their level and try to understand what they mean. So I think that's the first level of frustration is just trying to break the code of all these agencies, um, which are sometimes purposeful and sometimes not. Um, because language can either open conversations up or shut them down. And that's what happened in this book. Um, what else? I mean, you know, I don't think, I don't, I don't really think that there was some kind of malfeasance happening. I don't think people were trying to prevent me necessarily from, I mean, the people at the DEP were generous, helped me out. And, and like I said in the book that, you know, they'd give me big boxes of files and I'd go through it and be like 1981 next to 2010, no files that made sense. They probably just like take their inbox and they just go here, file this, you know, it's not a purposeful confusion. But it's, you know, really confusing. Um, or I'd get documents, people would send me stuff in milk crates or I'd get stuff, you know, I got sent, I don't know what, eight giant boxes like the day before my book was due to my publisher. So just things came in from everywhere. And again, it was like, it. I wrote it and I thought about the structure 
And I thought about that theme as in like, it was accumulating just like dioxin accumulates in our DNA. It's coming from all these places. I have to collect and like make it mean something. Like I had to put all those pieces of information and I did it in so many ways. I had like things on the wall and I had note cards and I had all these different methods, timelines and everything. And what it ended up doing was putting everything chronologically, all the paper. I mean, first doing it by subject, then putting it chronologically, because then it would make sense. I would see like this EPA rule happened like when my father got hired in the mill or something like that. You know, these personal and environmental things, again, back to those two things. And I saw how they meant things. And then it became clear, clearer anyway. Does that help? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And it's actually... Um... So sort of, I think a great segue to one of our one of the questions that came up um, during our book group discussion yesterday. And I don't know, Dawson, I saw you log in. If you want to, um, if you want to go ahead, I feel like this would be a good time to, to ask some of the those questions that you were you brought up yesterday. Sure, sure. Um, wonderful to meet you. Thank you for being here. Hi. Um, I wanted to know, I worked at DuPont for many years and looking at the, the number of mills on the number of rivers, whether it's Gorham or the Brandywine or the Delaware or whatever river with Lowell and Lawrence and those yeah. things with the, all the different types of mills, um, fabric and textile mills. Do you see, or have you heard, and, and maybe it's too soon, have other mills or other towns reached out to you about the impact that each particular mill has had on the river and the towns? Yeah, um, just one specific woman reached out to me. She had read my book and she's in Michigan. And now I'm blanking on the river, but paper mill, DuPont, all kinds of stuff was on that river yeah. and near, I think near Grand Rapids. Anyway, um, she set out to do the same thing I set out to do. And, and, you know, we were kind of helping each other and she finally got like teams of lawyers to fly. This has been very recently, like within the week, last week or two, teams of lawyers flying out, trying to set up shop, you know, renting a 5,000 square foot office and doing stuff. Erin Brockovich got involved. She had a conversation with her too. And she sent Erin over to me. And then it was all this. So it's like, that's the only place that I mean it's exhausting to do this work yeah. that's the thing it's like I can't I couldn't even do it I could just I be I feel like I just barely cracked you know the surface of it and this poor woman she was younger than me by probably 25 years so she had like you know but she was working full-time I wasn't I was like my father my father my husband was in the military sorry Drew he's on this phone call um he's in the military so I wasn't working except for on this book so yeah, I, I think there probably would be more people coming forward, all of, but nobody has time, energy, inclination, knowledge. I mean, to do this, it was just, it was overwhelming for me, less emotionally, but more like physically to yep. just wrestle all of this information. So I don't know. I wish there were some like environmental clearinghouse. I mean, some people have offered like, oh, if you want to do this and be an activist, I don't want to be an activist. I'm a writer. I'm not interested. In, I, that's not for me. My job is to write about it. So really what has to happen now, though, is like the community has to want to change um, instead of like the mill destroying evidence or whatever, or whatever's happening there. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, I don't know, but... I mean, yeah, lots of people told me about all their towns and all the dirty rivers in the United States. It's terrible. I don't, it is. Yeah. I don't know what's going to make it change. Maybe if that EPA report was published that they have on the shelf somewhere, maybe that would change, but they'll never publish it. Because what did that guy say to me at the end of the book? He said it would have devastating impacts upon the entire exactly. economy of the United States. So why would they publish that? <laughs> well, and along those lines, the second question that I had was, you mentioned you had several different tributaries and tangents and branches of the book and wondering when I was reading at the at the end when you said it's 2019 and you're in the basement of the DEP digging through all these boxes, how did you know when to stop and when, because this book could have gone on. It's still it's going on. on. <laughs> well, that's what I was yeah. going to say. It's still going on and it's still being researched and it's it's 
lit a fire, hopefully, in some places that, you know, with whether with PFAS or dioxins or yeah. other things in the environment, microplastics. I mean, there's so many things in the environment, but well, there's nothing like a stop and how far to dig on each topic. Well, there's two things. One thing is, is nothing like a deadline, right? So your publisher says your book's due and it's November and you got to turn it in. Um, so that was one thing. So, but, but I think the other thing is more, the more elegant answer is from John McPhee, who's one of my favorite writers. Um, he said, you'll know when to stop when you meet yourself coming the other way. And I take that to mean a lot of things, but it basically means if I start writing a new paragraph and I've already written about that, or if I like find myself repeating myself, then I'm like, oh, okay. I knew it started to like filter down and literally, but the last day before I was turning this book in, I got those eight boxes and I found a document in there with Stephen Lester's name on it. And I was like, wow, I emailed him a couple of years ago and I never fall. He followed up and I never followed up. So he became sort of the, the only sort of, I don't know, um, smoking gun a little bit in the book, but it was like, I, would, I, I think I knew when it was going to end is because I used a Winston Churchill quote and that's when I knew it was going to end. And I should tell everybody what that says. Let me go, let me just see. I got my book right here in a PDF. So for anybody who's a writer, if you use Winston Churchill, that means your book is pretty much done um, <laughs> because it's crazy. He said, he said at the um, a turning point of the war, he said, now this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So that's, I kind of took note of that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that Winston Churchill quote with you all. <laughs> All right. Um, so we had, a, there was another, um, you know, question that you, you sort of, you sort of alluded to in, um, you know, in the or earlier in the conversation and, you know, sort of talking about the mill and, you know, the precautionary principle versus burden of proof and that they weren't necessarily sort of setting out to, you know, maliciously destroy right. the community. Um, so Charlie, do you want to, um, uh, Charlie from our book, do you want to, um, you know, unmute yourself and ask the questions that you had, um, from yesterday? Yes. And it's, it's actually pretty tangential only because it's nothing descriptive. The, uh, question was, well, first, you know, obviously the mill, the, the, the mill created an economy that created the town. Right. The, the, then the mill dies or is dying. The, you know, this, this economic engine slows down and the town, you know, suffered for it. Do you think there's any way the town could have adapted to it where it, there wasn't so much poverty in the life? Again, that doesn't have a whole lot to do with your book, but it is tangential to it. No, I, it's actually something I thought about a lot because like I'm thinking, you know, past, present, and then future. What is really the future of this town along this geological timeline? And and I think part of it is, I think they're still depending on outside leadership, which I, there's a, there's a book, a guy did a thesis in 1994 about forest of dependency on the forest that I quote in the book, Thomas Beckley, uh, University of New Brunswick, I think he teaches now, but he spent this time in Rumford in Mexico and wrote about all the complications that that can cause. Um, and the same with um, Ralph Nader's book that I quote, I can't, a paper plantation that tells you everything right there. Um, so I did think about it because I read those pieces and that, that dependency on outside leadership, I saw come again in the form of Nestle. And when I say leadership, I mean, not town manager. I just mean like you know, they saw Nestle come in. Oh, Nestle's going to, you know, solve our problems. They're going to have new jobs. But it's like, again, here's a company that really doesn't care about you. They care about the bottom line. And especially, it's even worse nowadays, right? Because company, corporations can be seen as people in the, in the, you know, in the courts. So, not, you know, at least Hugh Chisholm, when he started the mill, was a, was a person. And, and, and so the, the, the arc of our mill from Hugh Chisholm to a Chinese company owning it is like the arc of American industry itself. And to say, we've come so far from like 
anybody even remotely knowing who's running the place. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, it needs to come back and, and not even come back, but it needs to get more in control of the people who live there. That's really the solution. And, and part of doing that is, um, again, like I'm trying to get a little bit more involved in my own communities, like go to those town meetings <laughs> or, you know, no, you know, I would have, you know, go to the boring water board meetings, or, or if you can't, maybe you have a group of people like your book group, one person can go per month and report back to the group. Like, I think that's a great way to go. So you don't have to suffer through all those really boring meetings where they talk about like taxes and snow plows. I don't know, whatever they talk about, <laughs> you know, anyway, um, I, I think that's really part of the solution is dot, stop depending on outside leadership. If the folks who own the mill lived in the town, do you think things would be different? Yeah, because they'd see all their family start dying too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe, um, you know, Hugh Chisholm never lived there really. He probably stayed there, but he had a house on Fifth Avenue, you know. Um, none of the owners did. Even a lot of the management never did. Yeah. And I think once it's really hard, it's a very, very different responsibility when you know a person too. You know, if you know people personally, you feel a different responsibility completely. Could the town have done anything differently from the beginning? Probably not. That's the yeah. way the world, that's the way the world worked. The yeah. solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, I mean, I think Hugh Chisholm did a really good job. He did better than Lowell and Lawrence Mass. Like he tried to really create uh, an ecosystem, a community. And I think it did. And even when I was growing up, it was actually a pretty good place to grow up. Um, but as, as the book outlines, a lot of stuff happened in the 70s and 80s. And I think Milton Friedman with his whole economic outlook really harmed the United States and the workers and all the strikes. And there's a lot of economic stuff that burbled up in those times that I think that that, that is in the book for those who haven't read it. Um, and I go through that and, and I think those really were the turning point, the 70s, 80s um, for a lot. I mean, by the time I left, there was no way I could go back. There was nothing to go back to. I could see it, everybody could. And paper making is not going to last um, in Maine for very much longer. It's just you can make paper cheaper and quicker in um, South America, for instance. I'm I'm not po I'm not optimistic. <laughs> I'm realistic. <laughs> um, thank you for that, um, Charlie. Did you have any more in your sort of questions that you had? Uh, not right now. Not okay, no, I, all right. That's why I just didn't want to, to jump in there. So um, that was what we had, had talked about. And it looks like now there is, um, there's a question that came in on the chat. And this is one, I guess, that I am not up on what is going on immediately in Maine. Oh. Yeah, so right now, and I don't know, Bruce, if you want to um, unmute yourself and, and ask it, but- um, Oh my God, it's terrible. <laughs> it looks terrible. Uh, For those yeah, not reading it. Yeah, where's yeah. Bruce? Where are you? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, great. I mean, I think Maine does have a history of metallic mining, uh, like the Callahan mine, for which we're still paying for uh, to clean up along with the, the feds. But uh, recently, Canadian miners have been looking at, at the state, uh, taking old maps uh, and, and uh, old ge geologic maps. And they're looking now at Mount Chase, and they're even looking in a township called Pembroke all over the state looking for metals. And, I'll, um, and they'll say, oh, we're looking for stuff for your uh, cell phones and your computers and lithium. But what they're looking for is gold and silver. And they will start. It's from New Brunswick. And they will start metallic mining in a very, very wet environment, take up tons of uh, earth, leave it on the top uh, of, uh, you know, on top. And then with the sulfur and all, all these metals are in sulfur form, sulfuric acid, acid mine drainage. And I think this is a very, very hot topic in, uh, in Augusta. If you look at LD 11, 
63 to ban metallic mining. So there's a lot going on. But the, the real thing is when you talk about sort of insidious, you know, little bits here and there, when you really look at what they're, they're going to be putting in a little bit of uh, uh, cadmium lead in the water here, a little bit of cadmium lead there. Yeah. And all the mountains, as you know, water runs from sort of the northeast you know, down. And this is very concerning because when you look worldwide, and I don't see any reason why they're going to change it, uh, you know, waste, air particles, water pollution from mining is very, very devastating. And we're at the beginning of it right now. I mean, th there's, they're applying to the Land Use Policy Commission um, for one permit, and they're looking at two others in the state. But the individual from the Canadian company said, Maine is, I think the term he used is silver mountains, you know, with all the, all the mountains. Mm -hmm. And this is very concerning. And, and you know, it's just gonna be a little here, a little there. And you talked about insidiousness and you talk, talked about mm -hmm. how the regulators really couldn't look at a little bit here, a little there. And that sort of talks about cumulative risk is, is sort of the technical term, as you know. And what can we do? I think, yeah. the, you know, the legislature doesn't care, the governor, both governors, LePage and Mills doesn't care. And the DEP, in my opinion, is a disaster. I mean, they can't, they can't yeah, regulate, well. they can't measure air pollution in South Portland. How are they gonna go up into, you know, Western Maine and Northern Maine? And I'll be quiet. So I'd like to get your input. It's, it's a problem. No, it's, I'm so, beginning. I don't know any. I can send you some this info is good. if you're interested. Yeah, I would love. I would love that. I put my email in the chat, and if you lose it, I can, it's on my website. Like yeah, because you account. can follow. Unfortunately, a problem from the beginning, which is yeah, I mean, you will see the you know a disaster from the beginning. I mean, if, I, what I what I think will at least start to help is I know a journalist. I think I don't know if he's from ProPublica Pro or HuffPost. Um, just moved to Maine and he's like, hey, do you know any good environmental things to work on? And I, if you send me some information, this would be a great thing to start reporting on because I think public pressure can, as I think is really underrated. I mean, that kind of public pressure, I mean, we see it on social media for anybody that's on social media, public pressure can like make or break people sometimes. So, you know, if somebody can start reporting on this in a very serious way, it, it could at least start, at least it will start like the, again, my book is revealing this, you know, I know there's probably reporting, but it's probably more like information reporting. There's probably stuff in the paper, but I'm saying somebody to do more of an investigation um, to really start questioning it. And that's why when I say journalism is not necessarily, shouldn't be objective, somebody should go in with a point of view and try to like dig up this stuff, but that's terrifying. I don't know anything about it. Um, and, and back to what you're saying too, the cumulative risk. It's also something I didn't say is, you know, it's this is one toxic I wrote about. It was just like, it's really arbitrary in a way, but all these toxics cumulatively is, you know, they, they, the things they say, you should eat only one fish or you should do this one thing, you know, or, or only this much in your body. That's just one chemical at a time. They never talk about the cumulative risks of toxics in our body or in the environment, never, never do they, not in Europe, not anywhere. So um, that's just something to be aware of. Um, and I think what I tell people is the best thing you can do is vote <laughs> for people who want you to live. <laughs> um, really, it because it really comes down to, um, you know, there's activists, but activists are always putting pressure on legislators. So it ends up being really about laws and that's really what i'm questioning in this book too is like what are these laws that they made they don't make any sense you know why should why should we have any chemicals allowed to be in our body and do i believe them when they say it's safe safe amounts is that even a thing is there a safe amount of mercury or arsenic <laughs> that should go in my body no there isn't because it's added with all these other things anyway i would love some more information on that um thank you for bringing it up and I will try to hand it off to somebody who can do better reporting than me. I mean, that kind of reporting. Although it might be interesting. I don't know, send it. Thank you. All right, I don't know. So that's the end of the questions that have come through the chat. Um, if anyone um, has any questions right now that they would 
like to ask Carrie um, directly to go ahead and unmute yourself. Otherwise, I was going to say I have. You know, well, Dawson's got something. Oh, Dawson. Sorry. Um, I was just when you said that the there, it, you can make paper cheaper other places. Mm. There was an article. This was years ago in Fast Company magazine talking about all the outsourcing to China and, and Asia and how Americans want to buy cheap goods. But so we're literally shopping ourselves out of jobs. So if the mill in Rumford and Mexico close, what's going to happen to the people there if they're looking for outside leadership? I mean, in terms of the economic and the financial and what's economy. happening. Yeah. What's happening is already happening. I mean, yeah. I just got some, I can't look at, I should have brought it up now, but like it's got the highest um, special education rate in the state. There's four to five kids are food insecure. I mean, the unemployment rate is the highest in the state. It's already happening. I mean, the mills only supports a handful of jobs now compared. I mean, what's going to happen is they're just going to get shoved into the corners of the state. Like they yeah. have, been, you know, worse and worse. And, um, you know, and that's why I just, you know, I don't know why Janet Mills says, you know, this is a critical book. It's like, this is your state. You know, these are not everybody these lives on the, these are your people. Not everybody lives on the coast and go, eats lobsters, you know? Um, some people make paper and they're good people. <laughs> you should care yeah. about them too. And this is, this is the kind of general world problem, right? And something that I write about too, people, whether it's Acadian, French Acadians that I write about, or whether it's uh, micmac or it's people who are disenfranchised or poor or uneducated they just get shoved into the corners because they don't have the time maybe they don't have the education whatever it is they don't have time to like deal with this they're busy right. working or trying to feed their kids or trying to stay alive you know yeah. i saw that so um I don't even know what the question was, but sorry. <laughs> well, it was just, you know, if if we outsource and you can make it cheaper and we want to buy cheaper goods because we are being it's downsized. it's problematic because the people, those people yeah. yeah, those people in those towns need to they, there's a Walmart there, but if they didn't have Walmart, what could they afford? You know, it's just it's really it's far more complicated than I could even venture to talk about. But there's a couple of good books that do talk about Kurt Anderson wrote a book and I can't think of the name of it. Maybe my husband will put it in the chat. Um, uh, a really good book about, he and I did an event. Kurt, I don't know if you know Kurt Anderson. He did Studio 360 for NPR for years. Yeah. So he, we did an event together and he came from, we wrote about the same exact sort of era and arc about uh, economics, but he his was very economically focused. Like he's just way smart. I'm not, I'm just a writer, but he's like, more about that, which is really interesting. Evil Geniuses, that was what it was called. Uh, really good book about um, maybe what could they have done or what they could do um, or how we got to this point too. That book is great. So Carrie, I have a final question for you. Um, and that is just, you know, after sort of writing all of, you know, researching and writing all of this, um, you know, where, where do you go from here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to bed. No. <laughs> um, it's funny because whoever said, I can't remember who said, but it's like, when do you know when to stop? Was that Dawson again? Um, there's so many like parts of this book I could sort of excerpt helicopter out and like write. And that that's kind of what I'm doing. I, I, I have a few ideas. I mean, as far as writing goes, um, you know, and all of them seem to evolve around um, working class people or ordinary people. These are the themes that I seem to be obsessed with or um, um, uh, the idea that people are treated like waste. Um, that's another theme that I'm interested in. And to that end, I just joined like the Royal Geographic Society in the UK. I just went to my first work group. Like I'm involved with all these 
people that study waste politics and waste studies and waste geographies and human geographies, it's totally fascinating and very, very interesting about waste because what I found out at least like, you know, we talk about recycling and all this stuff. Well, re all that kind of household goods is only 3% of our total wastes that we produce in the world. The rest is toxic. So I can't stop thinking about that. <laughs> so 97% of all our waste is toxic. Um, so basically when you like sort your garbage, it doesn't really matter because <laughs> it's the other stuff that's killing us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm optimistic though. I'm always smiling. Um, <laughs> So these are the th these are the things I'm I'm really interested in and and there's a lot of people doing. I'm really trying to interface with like uh, scientists and academics and artists to try to look at to try to bring this kind of storytelling in a because I think that's part of this book too is as I alluded to it earlier but environmental storytelling is you know there's like a few different kinds of stories there's like superwoman or superman comes in and saves a town and then there's like a very scientific book about owls or something and then there's another which i love that book by the way um there's a book about owls that just won a bunch of awards but then there's the book about um the investigative journalism thing like a legal thing i don't know there's these kind of books so i'm trying to like propose that there are different ways to tell environmental stories that could get humans activated and engaged with the issues. And that's what I was trying to do with this book instead of just, you know, writing about owls. I mean, I love owls, but I like humans more. <laughs> um, does that make sense? <laughs> do you think you have another book in your yes. I'm I'm working on, I'm working on a it might it may have changed since the last time I spoke to you, but <laughs> one was about uh, the idea originally was a biography of a sanitation worker, a woman, um, because I think from a woman, no less, and a sanitation worker, a lot of these ideas spin out about disenfranchisement, about toxic waste, about um, all of the things but in a very different way and I also takes on the whole genre of biography because we read so many biographies about famous people and they really don't matter that much whereas a sanitation worker if we didn't have sanitation workers we would really all be in trouble they are we our lives depend on them in a lot of ways so um, I was thinking about that um, and it was called biography of an ordinary woman but then somebody's convincing me to do something else saying that because I'm writing a bunch of essay, essays about ordinary women and this person said oh I think the ordinary woman is you so I don't know we'll see where it all goes <laughs> or I'm obsessed with ordinary women but anyway maybe to be several women <laughs> all right well thank you so much for your time, um, you know, for the time and energy that went into writing this book and, and sharing these stories and just sharing the experience um, and taking the time to talk with us tonight. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks for it. I, I can't believe you all stayed the whole hour and a half. Thank you very much. I feel I'm like, I, I feel like I won something. Thank you. <laughs> it's been really great. Um, yeah, I put my email in the chat if there's anything else. Let me know. Um, did you want to, and now I'm going to put you on the spot, what? had mentioned your offer since you can't do book signings. Um, oh, yes, right. If anybody, I, I mean, I feel, I'm like, I feel funny saying this, but if you want me to sign your book, I can. I can send you a book plate, a signed book plate with your name oh, and cool. whatever you want me yeah. to say. Yeah, yeah, because I haven't been yes. able to go anywhere and sign books and I have all these <laughs> stickers and um I'll send you a book plate. Just send me your address and okay. tell me you were here and tell me whatever. Tell me, tell me your dirty, dark secrets. <laughs> but please, yeah. I would love to. I've only signed like a handful of books. <laughs> oh, tell you, that's great. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Okay. Thanks. And I hope to see you all 